<laughs> I remember being real nervous for that game. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna lie, because I'd seen you play the Iron mm. Series and obviously you played Super in that, so it was yesterday. What did you say before? Didn't you say you scored him? No, 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 I didn't say that. Ask him about this. No, I didn't I taught him a lesson. No. Fof's a really good player, but I don't think he's, he's big enough to to play for the first team when he's when he's still so small and ended up making a, a great tackle on, on our captain back then, which was a, a very big guy and everybody sort of then knew, okay, he, he can do it. Mm. Went down, had a prayer, say thank you. A lot of guys, some are crying, some are completely overjoyed. Myself, very overjoyed. Um, Every night fly to different, fly to Durban, next morning, go out all day, that night fly to Cape Town, just keep going, keep going. and. Just every city, you've, you're so drained, and then you you just see what it means to people, and you just yeah. back on it again. And, That's giving me good. Um, That's incredible. Welcome to the show, guys. Good to be back. Will Gets, good to have you, and warm welcome to Faf, our first South African guest of the show. How are we all doing today? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. I'm well. I'm really looking forward to this conversation as a fellow halfback, so I'm excited. Let's kick into, I guess, what we do normally first, which is how do we how do we all know Faf here? I think I've played him on his test debut in Brisbane. I think it was 2016. Um, I remember watching you play Super Rugby and obviously you had the makings of a, of a great player then. And I remember thinking to myself I, in the build-up to that test, I was thinking, this, this player can play. I better make sure I'm, I'm on. Uh, and yeah, I remember... Uh, since then, watching you play, like you've just been a fierce competitor. Uh, for me, anyway, grateful to be a part of, you know, that story playing in mm. your first test. I guess it's so much more considerate to Faf than to non to Australian guests. You just or me. Yeah. <laughs> He's forty years old. I'm going to be nice to him. Yeah, but you should be nice to your. Man, I, I copped years of abuse on the bus from this bloke because so. your standards weren't good enough. Well, there you go. <laughs> I've got to be nice to him. He's yeah, a no, world no, champion. No, no. World champion. He's a halfback. He's. Uh, Someone I look up to as a player, so mm. I didn't look up to him. Gets, have you played against Faf? No, were? this first time I met him just mm. before. Um, so obviously, just admired him from you know, obviously, a lover of the sport. I love rugby, love the way he competes. A small man like myself, he's bigger than me, but mm -mm. still a smaller stature player. So I love it, you know, watching those guys compete. So, Faf, let's let's go to sort of the, the start of your career, I guess. It seems a logical place to start. So you came into the Lions and played played a few years for them, but, it, but you're not actually from the Joburg area, are you? No, so um, yeah, I started off at the Lions as a junior player, um, then sort of fell out of contract after my second year there. Wasn't sure if I'm going to stop playing or try something else or what 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 I'm supposed to do now. Um, and then um, I got an opportunity to play for the Pumas, which is a, a bit of a lower division team. And yeah, the coach there was my coach at school. Um, he sort of said, listen, come for a tryout and we can, I need a nine for, a, well, a, a guy to bench, basically, um, just a backup. And um, yeah, had a, a pretty quiet season, first season, next season, uh, got a few starting opportunities and then got the opportunity to go to the Lions. Um, so yeah, so, and then from there on, yeah, kicked, kicked on. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was, a, I think, a, a, a very good part of my growing up as a rugby player, learning how to deal with um, disappointment and coming through that. I think we, all of us have probably gone through stuff where you think, I'm not going to come back from this, bad games, all that, and the way you can flip it. I think I'd learned early on. Um, no, that's probably where the fight comes from, where you spoke about earlier. And Was there a moment there when you went back to the Pumas? Was there like one game or one moment where you felt like the clicked, the kind of helped that momentum to go to the lines and then pushing on and you know, having the career you've got? Um, I don't know if you know who the coach was. It's uh, Jimmy Stonehouse. So he's a massively built guy um, <laughs> and very, very tough. Um, and my first year there was kind of difficult because he was really, really tough on all my standards on passing and kicking, which sort of helped me a lot because I didn't have off days. He forced me to go and do extra work and all that type of things. and. Um, I remember getting a start finally against not a good team, getting pulled off at, on 30 minutes and then thinking again, like, what the hell's going yeah. on? It's, it's not great. And then, yeah, the second season came, um, a guy, Sean Fenter, went up to go play for the EP Kings for Super and I sort of got my starting chance. And I think I got man of the match first or second game in and I just sort of felt like I've, I've found my groove now and mm. all this hard work that I put in the last year is really coming through now. Yeah. Just had a 
a lot more confidence about it. And he obviously, he's sort of those, one of those guys that always back you, but he won't tell it to your face. And I could sort of see that relationship building much better for him, for him to back me more, still being hard, but backing. Um, and yeah, I think we, from that season, we had a really, really good season. Went up to Curry Cup the following year through relegation and stuff. And um, yeah, went on to go and to a, a trial for the, for the Lions. Do you credit a lot of the success you've had to those early years where you're building good habits, you're getting pushed by a good coach to be able to work on your skills, you're kicking and being consistent in that space? The, definitely. The way we played at school, box kicking wasn't a thing really. So I get to the Bulls um, under, under, under 16 level. Guys are box kicking mm. probably better than I am now still. And I'm thinking, how are they kicking so well? Mm. And I've never really done this before. It's just play for me. Um, so wasn't very consistent box kicker at all or anything I could kick but playing fly off and passing was all right but that that definitely helped a lot and and a lot of that extra work then I could just kick on from there and then learn from players around me um, going forward yeah also the tough coaching mm. I reckon there's less and less of that nowadays for like kids coming through we've yeah. been talking about this the last couple of days but like it's almost like PC, you, you've got to be careful what you can actually say nowadays. But without that tough coaching, I know for me personally, if I didn't have the senior players that would ride me mm. and be tough on me, then you don't build those habits and you don't get used to working hard, um, accountability, all that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, we tend to struggle with that, I think, at the moment mm. in Australia. But is is that something that that is happening in South Africa or do you guys still have a good dynamic around that space where there are coaches that are hard on players, senior players holding yeah. players accountable? In like a national setup, they've always said they'll, they'll pick Warriors instead of just the best player. So guys that can handle that and um, can handle the tough criticism. And and if you're not, if you don't want to, if you don't want to deal with it, then they'll just pick someone else. So mm. they don't want anybody that's going to be funny with it. So, yeah, 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 I like that. And I, th I think for me, a lot of South African boys are grown, we grow grow up with a father that's pretty pretty tough, tough on you mm. and you love him and it's all fun but he can also be like put you in your place if you need to if it needs be so i think that's a type of culture but which is also changing now which is making it more difficult yeah. so um but yeah i think like i said for us as a national side it's just to try to select the right guy then maybe the best guy so you you don't get that princesses that, those, you know the people yeah, that are, yes. are very sensitive and they don't want cheerleaders and yeah yeah so well, not on the not on the field. No. <laughs> yeah. Next to yes. yes. So, I mean, it sounds like you you came close to almost giving up playing, basically. Yeah, not by choice. Um, yeah, it was uh, the size thing was back back then was a was a big issue. No matter what I try to do, put on size, put on weight, just never really. Yeah, few guys were in his positions that just didn't believe in that. Um, so yeah, that was that was an issue, and luckily got got the chance, and then. Um, yeah, then sort of showed that I can do all the other stuff that other guys could, but um, yeah, I can. I think now it's it's not really even spoken anymore. There's so many great yeah, players cool. out there that. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting as well. Like if they're talking about size, like you look at guys like Free Dupree or Yust, mm. like they're taller. Yeah, but they when no one as physical as someone like yourself. So I find that incredibly interesting that that was ever an issue. Yeah, but I remember even when I was first coming through because I was mm. one of the first smaller centres. Um, you're playing mm. like 110 kilo centers, even in South Africa, they're all big, breaking down those barriers mm. early on. Like for me, it was it was challenging because I knew every game, the first 20 minutes they're going to target me. Like you're going to look for quick ball, who's the smallest in the back line. So you almost had to prove yeah. yourself, mm. that small man syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, and definitely. Think, yeah. You know, obviously it sounds like you went through the same challenges early on mm. just to get an opportunity being smaller. But then once you're given the opportunity, you could show that, you can mix it? Yeah, yeah. First year Super Rugby, I, I was interviewed by someone and sort of same thing like, do you think your size is going to be an issue going forward? And that was, I remember specifically saying, you playing amazing rugby and international and all this. And Aaron Smith is there. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, they might be a little bigger or I might be a little bigger, but I just mentioned that. Mm. Why are you questioning me if those guys are doing it already? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was just the, uh, yeah. So yeah, you got to prove always, yourself. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I wish I could tackle like you. <laughs> I think I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm thinking I'm small. That's your heart that's small. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, that's tough. Here we go. 
<laughs> you had too many. I don't know what's in that cup. But you, you did make the decision, as you say, to leave after that. You'd made the Springboks the previous year. Just talk us through sort of the, the thinking there, because at the time, there was no, if you left, you weren't able to play mm. for South Africa anymore. Yeah, I sort of fell out of favour with the Springboks, just had that feeling and wasn't selected for certain camps and stuff. And all of the, out of the sudden, out of the blue, came this opportunity from Sale to go to England. Um, and yeah, at, at that stage, I knew that the, the ruling was there with a, I don't even think it was three caps that you had to play to still be selected. But yeah, just felt like it was the right time to go. A um, lot of stuff in the media being said, coaches, again, about can I kick? I was always considered to be a running halfback, so I can't play the kicking game. So I thought maybe I can go over, over there, get used to some different conditions and all that stuff. And with a, obviously in the back of my head thinking in a World Cup year, they can select who they want. Um, hopefully do well enough to, to be selected for a World Cup squad going forward. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, to get out of a bad space at that stage and always wanted to play in Europe and, and to see what it's like. And um, yeah, then went over to, to sail. What did playing over there do for your game? Because it's almost like once you went over there, your game just went to another level. You're playing at a high level consistently, obviously. From then, it seems kicked on to become the player that you mm. are now. What was it about going over there that, that, I guess, propelled you to that level? I think the, the big thing for me was, like, f- sort of from day one, was responsibility that I got. Which sort of sounds a bit daunting, but I sort of loved it in a way. Um, at one stage, I was kicking for poles, doing kickoffs. Then the next time I'll, I'll chase kickoffs, then kick for touch, then be captain. Then, So it just like thrown into all these situations what I had to do, which I sort of loved. It just keep mm. on giving me challenges and challenges. And um, yeah, I just had a lot of responsibility, which I think made me definitely gain confidence. Um, and then obviously the conditions and the way you have to play in certain games and just yeah, I was relatively unknown in England by that stage, so um, it's quite easy to have a good season in a in a new sort of environment if, if guys don't know you. Um, so I had a, a good first year, and then to kick on from there was was then going to be the challenge, which I knew which which could happen. Um, but yeah, that that really helped me a lot, and it, it definitely made me then the player that I am today, being more consistent. Um, not being just reckless and running everything when I want to and having more of that game management style of play. And, um, but yeah, I think um, learned a lot, learned a lot there and it was, it was a great experience. Weather is absolutely horrible. Horrible. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. But you, I love Manchester. Yeah. It was really, really cool. The, um, do you find the rugby over there more similar to test rugby? Like prepared you better for test rugby compared to super rugby? Yes. Yes. Um, some years were so competitive every every week and the, the type of game that you have to play because of the weather is sort of more that tense, um, territory-driven mm-hmm. type of game, which definitely prepared us, or myself, a lot better. And also learning to play to, to play against guys from England and from Argentina and, yeah. from, and playing against guys against France and just seeing a lot more bunch of players that you get used to. So now you go into a test match, you know you've played against this guy two or three times and you got a bit of um, info on him as well, which, which definitely helps. But um, playing style for me was a lot more test match-like feel, Yeah, definitely. Now I'm considered to be the guy that only kicks. So it's <laughs> gone full you can't circle from you can't gone kick and then now I can't run anymore. So it's uh, it's gone, gone, gone all over the show and yeah. Yeah. Is it similar experiences for you guys? I mean, I guess everyone in their career goes through periods, but it's not necessarily the best things being written about them. But I was like, yeah, I had real good advice from him really early on when I started. I think I was, it was 2009. And I remember I'd, had, I'd played a couple of good games. I was sitting there reading the paper and he walked past me and he goes, what are you doing? I was, I was like, oh, I'm just re- reading about the game. And he said to me, he goes, Look, if you ever read the good, you read the bad or you don't read it at all. And it really stuck with me because I, you, you can you can often get too high if you read all the good press, but then the same thing if you read the bad press, you get real low. And so early on, I just thought to myself, well, why bother with it? Because to, to your point, it's like all these people that are going to say all these things about me, if they could do it, they would do it themselves. And so that sort of gave me a bit of peace. And yeah. I was fortunate to have guys like, like this this fellow here to, to help me with things like that. 
It's not your coach. It's not your teammates that are writing these articles. So why do you care? Like as a, as a football player, um, I know it used to upset my family a lot. Like my brother, my brother oh, would so. create uh, different accounts under a different name <laughs> just so he could go back at people. He was telling me like after, just recently, uh, after I retired, he said, I know I used to read all this stuff and, and have a go at people. I was like, why are you even bother? Because you... Like, it, it didn't really get to me, but it got to my family. So for me, I only really cared about like my teammates, obviously, one, mm. the coaches, what, what they would say. But deep down as a player, you've played long enough, you know if you've played good or bad. You don't really need the papers to tell you otherwise. So, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I've, I've stayed away from it from, like, pretty much from the start of my career. I never really got involved in it. So it was more... Yeah, like I said, the teammates, the coaches, that's who you respect and who you want to hear from. It's a tough one now too with like social media. Yeah. yeah. Like the general public has such access to the to the athlete. Instant. Yeah, instant mm. access to mm, the yeah. athlete where you put up a photo or like they'll go comment on a photo and say, oh, you, you were trash or blah, blah, blah. And, it, you know, you speak to a lot of the young kids now because they spend so much time on their phone. Yeah. It, it tends to really affect their mental health. So it alters the way they see the game. They might think, oh, I played well, but then they'll read someone that said, could be 60 good comments and one mm. bad one. And that bad one will be like, oh, gee, I need to worry about that. Like, it's instant gratification or or whatever you want to call it, negativity straight away. Mm. When I first started, if you were to read the papers, you had to wait till the next day. Like, you had to wait till the next day for mm. the newspaper to hear how you played or how the public thought yeah. you played. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a tricky time for these young kids because, like, you can see it. Automatically, I remember when I first came back from France, as soon as the game's over, a lot of people straight on their phones yeah. or taking selfies. And not that it's right or wrong, but it's just a different time now. Mm. Um, I think it was much simpler back when I started. So, Duff, talk us through this uh, debut you had that obviously well, you played in. Um, that was Queensland, I think it must yeah, have been. Yeah, Brizzy, 2016. Mm. It was my first time playing against Australia. It was We played Ireland in South Africa. So, my, yeah. So it was my fourth fourth test, I think it was. Um, yeah, we still saw jerseys that game. We still have your jersey, so that's pretty cool. I, I remember <laughs> being real nervous for that game. Um, yeah. I'm not going to lie, because I'd seen you play the mm. Irish series and obviously play Super in that. So I, I remember that test yeah. like it was yesterday. What did you say before? Didn't you say you scored in? No. Nah. Yes, you did. <laughs> I didn't say that. You didn't have said this before. You probably did. No, he said no, you first time. No, I said that. Ask him about this. No, I didn't say that. I taught him that. a lesson. No. It was something like that over lunch. <laughs> I know time. what you... You, you know can tell. That. You can tell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're trying to make no, yourself about him again. Yeah. Yeah. Again. I wouldn't lie. I didn't say that. I wouldn't lie. I didn't say that. But you can ask my family. I remember being real nervous about it because I remember thinking this bloke can play. What last thing you want to happen is be showing up. Look, I'm from Brizzy in your hometown. So I remember... Yeah, I remember that test like it was yesterday. Yeah. Like, that's my first time playing against Australia in Australia. And it was a bit surreal. Like, I've always looked up to him. Like, when was when did you debut or start playing Super? Uh, 2007. Yeah, see, I was still still at school. So, not trying to be funny, but that's, like, <laughs> that's how you look up to. Like, you see your guys playing, other nines playing, similar size. And, yeah, you sort of build your game around it. So, yeah, it was surreal to sort of play against guys like him and... Um, be in that moment, but also then, yeah, you, know, you just really want to win. And Suncorp too. Mm. Mm. That's a, for me. I reckon that's the best stadium in Australia. Yeah, no, it's good to play at. What was the difference that you found playing, like between us playing Australia and New Zealand? Things just filled a lot quicker against against the All Blacks for me, um, both ways. Like I felt like I had to do things quicker, um, and it also on defence or vice versa. Just felt like I had to. Everything was just rushed and. To be honest, my first year for me as as a international was I don't think I was really ready to play international rugby yet. Like remembering certain details of games I can, but a lot of it is just a blur because I think I was just like so all over there, just trying to do as much as I can and not really in that calm space. Coming back the next a year to, or two years later, feeling a lot more composed and and ready for it. So um, that's why I think everything felt so rushed. But just, but Oz was just for me always very, very physical. Just, it, it was a tough test. Like even if we'd win or you would win, it, it, that doesn't matter. It just afterwards just felt really sore. But uh, All Blacks were never physic, physical for me, just really quick. Was there a game internationally in that next year that clicked? Like there's one where you thought, okay, well this is a level that I can dominate or I can compete at or? 
Yeah, my first game back against in 2018 against England. Um, got man of the match that game against England. I think we were 23 three points down um, at half time and came back in, to win that game. So yeah, it felt after that, obviously playing with and against a lot of the guys that were in the English squad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I knew them had confidence and um, but yeah, that that's when I f sort of felt like okay, I can kick on from here. I'm, I feel a lot more comfortable and confident to to and to take control of certain situations. Yeah. Have a bit more of a voice. Where back then it was just just do what you're told yeah. and yeah, still scared basically. One of your huge strengths is obviously your physicality. You know, you, I think there's like a highlights reel on YouTube of you just putting big tackles on forwards. I think. <laughs> um, where does that come from? Is it become, does it come from the fact that you were told that you were too small, having that chip on your shoulder, wanting to prove people wrong? Um, definitely, that's part of it, trying to make big hits. Because I, even at school, um, being 17, going for trials to play for the first team, um, saying, like, Faf's a really good player, but I don't think he's, he's big enough to, to play for the first team when he's, when he's still so small. And, Ended up making a, a great tackle on, on our captain back then, which was a, a very big guy, and everybody sort of then knew, okay, he, he can do it. Mm. And also, I think technique has a a big role to play with it as well. Like being, you have to be a bit fearless and reckless sometimes, but technique has a lot to do with it. Like you can be as physical as you want. If you can't tackle properly, you're always going to come off second best. So, been taught from a very young age by my dad how to. Um, sort of try and tackle as correctly as possible, which I think has a, has a big influence because, yeah. I don't know, you've probably seen in Japan, guys are up for it to tackle, but they just, there's a, I see a lot of guys bumped in, in yeah. Japan for some reason. And I think it's definitely a technique flaw that just happens. They're not scared, they're running in with everything they have, but it's just a technique thing. So I think a bit of both, but yeah, the fight to, to prove that point is definitely probably the thing that I, Try and get at the most. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen a highlights reel of you on YouTube. Of you, you, you get run over. <laughs> you get run over. <laughs> it probably goes as long as his. Longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had to make your tackles and mine. <laughs> Let's talk about that recall. You'd left thinking that maybe you could play in a World Cup year, but obviously they changed the rules. And and then getting that recall. I mean, did you expect that? Was was that a surprise when it came to you? Yeah, very very surprising. Um, when they scrapped that, uh, I think. Vincent Koch phoned me and because he was playing for Saracens and Rasi spoke to him and he also only had like 10 caps or 7 caps or something and he's speaking to me about possibly they're going to scrap this rule possibly and he, he spoke a bit about with Vince about me, what my personality is like and all that and um, yeah then yeah, I sort of got that feeling that things might start to turn yeah and um, yeah it's a bit surreal at, at that stage getting the opportunity after leaving South Africa and within a year getting back into the mix. Um, yeah, it was sort of a, a dream a dream that, that, that came true, yeah. What's Rassi like as a, as a coach? Because we've obviously he's got a very big public personality, mm. but is he the same? Is he like that with, with the players as well, or is he a bit different? The best way to say is just that his number one priority and everything is just the Springboks and making sure the Springboks is, is looked after. Um, He's got a massive love for the badge and would do anything to, um, despite himself, to, to make sure that we get something that we deserve if we, if we deserve it. Um, <clears throat> but he's, he's an he's a awesome guy off the field. Very, very tough when, when he needs to be, um, like we spoke about earlier. Um, yeah, he, he puts you in your place if, 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 you, if he needs to. Um, so I think but what he's done well is, is that sort of being your can be your friend but also then the respect of, of being your coach and having that balance between the whole thing so you can go out have a, f have a few beers together and really enjoy each other's company but um, you still know that that is a boss and um, they need to still be on your toes um, come Monday or whenever the next session is so um, yeah but he's nothing bad to say about him is his Twitter account is that new you know he's dancing um, drinking have you seen oh, a lot seen of that. Yeah, 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 I've seen that yeah all through lockdown and stuff. Was it? Was it lockdown? Was that when <laughs> yeah. he created it? Yeah. yeah. You can see he's up for a bit of fun. Yes, yes, yes. No, he, he loves it. He loves to uh, just kick the ball around, play games with players and coaches and all that. And 
also when, when it's time to go, is is, is ready to go. So yeah. I think that, that's a uh, switch. Yeah. Mm, that switch is, is is very important. And with the type of group that we have, there's a lot of those guys in in the group that like to have a good time, but mm. then can then when it needs to be focused and and get ready to go. Yeah. Let's talk about 2019. So obviously, that's a quite a big year for you guys. Um, Rossi came in effectively turned the team around a little bit. You had some tough times in 2018, but mm. it turned it around 2019. Going into that World Cup, what was sort of your confidence levels like? What were your expectations? To be honest, like the, the build-up was was pretty good. We I think we we, you know, we just won the, what's it, the championship. We won the championship and going into the World Cup feeling really, really confident. The confidence, they like they just kept saying, we definitely going to win this. Like, doesn't... Every team that's won the championship or Tri Nations, they don't win the World Cup that year. If you lose your first pool game, you don't win the World Cup. So everything was just like so, and they just kept saying the coaching staff just kept saying like we're definitely going to win the, the World Cup. So the the confidence was there, the belief was there. Losing against New Zealand that first game was sort of a blessing, um, just to see where we've done wrong and how much we can improve on. And um, the guys just bounced back straight away, and then yeah, had a had a good run in. It's still weird to think about, but I think our, we believed in our chances really well. Um, and we, we thought we, we can do it, but it, it's still a World Cup and anything can happen. But um, yeah, it turned out the, the way we wanted it to, luckily. Talk us through the dynamic of that group. I remember in 2015 when we went to the final, everybody was so aligned, everybody's all on the same page. And that makes such a difference, that off-field stuff, to when you have to perform on the field. It seemed like you had a great bunch of characters together. And then you look at you guys at the bomb squad, I think, was mm. at that time. It seemed like everybody knew what their roles were. Yeah. Everybody was very much aligned. Talk us about what that group was like and how much of a difference that made towards you guys obviously winning the title. The non-playing squad, they were absolutely amazing because um, like you said, like we all knew what our, what our role was, but the trick is to have those guys buy in. Mm. You can say, listen guys, you eight guys are probably not going to play a lot this World Cup. You're going to have to paint pictures for the team that's going to play. And, and they can say yes, but disappointed and then you but you can lose guys that way yeah. and yeah the way they just turned up was 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 amazing and um that's one of i 100 percent credit that to one of the reasons why we won the world cup is those guys literally going through sessions of the other team training exactly like that team mm. plays against us giving us the exact pictures that we need and still doing it with a smile on your face obviously guess, being the yeah we're being it's not nice being dropped or not being selected and being on the bench and but the buy-in was to win the world cup and it's going to be a squad effort and without that we wouldn't have done it not at all and we actually had a few drinks and before we went to the whole world cup thing and um big night big session for the boys and coaches end up leaving and we sat there for about two hours around the fire boys going hard but Still, it's still conscious and, and still enjoying a few beers together. And then let's just sorting out every single possible problem that could be there. Like, what if you're not selected? What's the drinking policy? What's this policy? What, just like sorting out what, the, what type of music are we going to play on the bus? Because we've got 11 different languages, mm. so many different cultures. How are we going to sort this out? And just having like open and honest conversations about all this. And like, Sia and them love to sing before a game. and that might annoy another guy mm. that doesn't like it. And now we, is it going to affect some guys? Is it going to, so just talking through all that, like you said, is in, then getting to those, the right guys. Because if you have a, a few rotten apples, they were just going to not yeah. buy in into a lot of that stuff. And I think that is a credit to the selectors and just the guys being literally just willing to sacrifice a few things for, for the success of the team. Yeah, I mean, it's true though. Guys that say, yeah, I want to play, yeah, I'm, what, I'm going to be a squad man, going to be a team man. But then you get a few weeks in and you still haven't got your opportunity. All you're doing is holding the pad. They can quickly turn acidic yeah. and that can spread pretty quick amongst those eight guys where they're complaining to each other um, and you don't have that full buy-in. So that's a pretty special group that you've got. Mm. With um, the World Cup, obviously, it was a dream of mine to win, which I never got. Talk me through that. Straight off the game, went down, had a prayer, say thank you, um, ran on and obviously it's then a lot of guys, some are crying, some are completely overjoyed. For myself, 
very overjoyed and um yeah it's a dream come true now mm. it's obviously it's it's amazing and um i think it actually sort of just started sinking in when we got back to south africa because there's there's a good contingent of south african players uh, um, supporters at, at the stadium but you never really got that sense of what actually just happened mm -hmm. and um yeah two-day bender on the way back to <laughs> to south africa yeah, exactly. um just uh, enjoying each other's company and they didn't think we we're gonna win the final or be in the final so we had to split up in like five different groups fly off and like eight goes there eight goes there and we just eventually got to Joburg at some stage and then yeah getting out on the airport seeing what the hell just going on here was mm. that's when when it sunk sunk in and um the trophy tour everywhere we go seven six different towns we had to fly to every day um every night fly to a different fly to durban next morning go out all day that night fly to cape town just keep going keep going and just every city you you're so drained and then you you just see what it means to the people and you just yeah. back on it again and that's giving me goosebumps um, that's incredible yeah mm. it, it, it was that was probably the the most special experience to to see that and and what it means to to people and at that stage and still now there's a lot of things in south africa that that's not great but that was just that week could just see people united yeah which you never which is especially in that time it was it was a tough time in south africa and you, you can see what what power of sport has in especially in south africa and, and i know all over the over the world but just people uniting and even even if we don't change if we didn't change something somebody's life at least it was for a week. Gave a bit of yeah, gave a bit of hope, that, yeah, but a, yeah, yeah. Bit of hope and a bit of joy for for that day or for that two hours or whatever mm. it was. Um, so yeah, that was amazing. What about the significance of obviously Sia Kulisi being the first black South African captain? Was that something that again acted to galvanise the group in terms of you as a playing group and and inspire you guys as well? For sure, um, but it wasn't just it wasn't just Sia. Sia has obviously um, has done amazing things where he's come from but there's a lot of those guys mm. in in that side and you you sort of get inspiration from from all of that but um a lot of the guys that i played with they didn't even know where what their circumstances were and finding out during that time guys speaking up and some guys asking tough questions coach rasi asking guys literally just tell me what the story was so the rest know and I think that's where you sort of get closer as, yeah. as a group. Um, if I know your background, know what you went through to get you, I can I can fight for you because yeah. I know you're going to fight for me. So mm. um, I think that whole thing about CR and my PMP and um, they are just just awesome guys to be around and and yeah, you know they're going to have your back in in any situation. So yeah, it's great. After you win something like that, like the Rugby World Cup, how do you stay motivated? What do you need to do to continue to reinvent yourself? It's just chasing your own standards. Mm. Like I've always said, there's. I don't think it's possible to like play a perfect game of rugby. You you can't pass any better. You can't kick any better. You can't tackle any better. I don't think there's a ever a place where you can reach that. So I think you can always strive to to get there, but I don't think you ever will. And still, I still think I can improve on a lot of things. And I think that's where the drive comes from. And then then playing for your country obviously is just a just a pride thing. Um, you don't want to lose if you play for your country and going to i don't want to let people down like coming to a new club or going to a new club you want to rock up there you've been playing well and now you're just like disappointing everyone that's mm -hmm. that's come to watch you or the people that's put faith in you to pay you good money to be here and now you're just disappointment so i always want to rise above that as well um but yeah, i don't know it's, it's, if it's similar for you guys but yeah that's, that's just, exactly what we we're just talking about yeah. at lunch it's like um, once you come to a new place, in my mind, I've got an idea of how they see me and I don't want to disappoint them. Yeah. So you almost over-deliver, over-prepare. Um, you'd rather over-deliver than under-deliver. Yes. You're similar, like you're in a team yeah. now that's getting flog smokes weeks, but you still prepare well, you still train hard, you still... Yeah, like, I mean, the, the, the thing for me is discipline and habits, they, they transcend winning and losing. Yeah, yeah. Once you get to a certain level, you you don't necessarily allow outside factors to to motivate you or affect who you are. 
you turn up and you train as hard as you normally yeah. do because you hold yourself to those standards. Mm. Regardless of winning and losing, you're still going to turn up and do what you do. Yeah. Um, and so that's certainly the way that I've always been. I've been fortunate to have developed that over the course of my career. Some games you play and you think, listen, did I, like, am I losing it a bit here? Because, <laughs> yeah, like, you just, it didn't <laughs> click. And you think, did I underprepare or did I overprepare yeah. or did I overthink it? Or So I, I still constantly try and still figure out what's the best, like, pre preparedness for me going into games. And so... I'm still trying to f get that balance of over preparing or just playing on instinct as well. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, that's always a, probably going to be the fight and, and the struggle yeah. to, to find out there's, there's not a right or wrong, mm. I guess. Yeah. Who were some of the like halfbacks that you sort of molded your game around? Because for me, like I, I've always said that I think Fareed Dupree is probably the best that I've ever seen. You know, I watched him as a young kid growing mm. up and I, I tried to take as much as I could from his game and I remember playing a Barbars game with him that week in 2009. Mm. I just sat Finally, there. Finally, I got a pass here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just sat there and just watched him because I was so taken back by the fact that this free Dupree. And then mm. just picked up little things around the way he prepared for games and asked him questions around mm. certain pictures that he was seeing. You've obviously had some great halfbacks play for the Springboks. Mm. Who, who are the guys that you sort of looked up to and, and molded your game around? Funny enough, not really too many halfbacks growing up. More just like nippy quick guys doing mm. punching above their weight so there was a guy called brent russell which i really yeah, yeah. really liked um uh brayton paul so we spoke about yeah just those sort of type of guys um nines i'm gregan definitely as a nine just his like skillful passing and yeah just the no, I think we still call it the Gregan pass, the, the inside, yeah, inside ball. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so stuff like that yeah. would would inspire me to to train and, and work on it. Yeah, you sort of pick things up from different people. Yes. you're your own player essentially. But yeah, you're, you know, you pick something from as the players that you've suggested. What about yourself? You you played a bit of halfback. Who did you look up to? Hmm. This is a loaded question. I don't really know where you're going. <laughs> I, I got a, I did get a couple of tests. I think I played five tests at halfback. Really? Yep. Um, I went on. I didn't. Season, I, I didn't look up to him as a end of season tour. Actually, replaced Griggs, so that's my that's my claim. Okay. No, they gave him a rest before the 2007 World Cup. But I was saying to Will yesterday, the one thing I hated at that time, the halfbacks used to come all the way on a scrum, oh, all yeah. the way up, so I couldn't see like either side of me where I had to pass. So I just went down, and it's almost like I had to guess where they were. So I'd throw it look up and it went well <laughs> it was a good learning curve for me mm. because i kind of learned what a halfback needed to when i moved back out to 10 and 12 like what actually makes your job so much mm. easier so yeah it was tough like physically like the amount of running getting there to the ball quick but i learned a lot from that experience yeah. anyone i looked up to were kind of um they were in my team at that time so i had like the team that i walked into with george gregan steve larkham mm. sterling mortlock joe roth uh, all World Cup winners. Well, yeah, yeah. they like, like. I can learn as much as I can, so yeah. I just tried to soak it all up. Mm. So after that World Cup, you talked about you know maintaining your own standards, but you also had a Lions tour coming up, which must have been a, a massive motivation for you guys. Yeah, it took a while to get to the Lions tour. We we had almost had all the all the cups. We just needed the the Lions, the British and Irish one, which then would complete the whole the whole thing. And um, that was COVID, wasn't it? Yeah, on COVID. Yeah. Yeah. No. No crowds. No crowds, um, isolated in a hotel for, for four or five weeks. And what does that mean? So no outsiders, like your wife couldn't visit, no one like... So that she missed the window when we went to the bubble. So she had to isolate for 10 days in a hotel just like next door to our hotel. Mm. So she had to be there, literally just in her room. She got her food and a plate. That was it. We could only go to training, gym, come back and just at the hotel. The whole hotel was just us and staff wow. and then family when they eventually joined after their quarantine period. So very fun times at, at times and also very, very challenging. And I think a few guys got a bit crazy and wanted to leave and ended up staying and very tough. Um, but to manage still to win that, that tour after not playing for more than a year as a group together, um, yeah, was was really special and to yeah just once again like through 
adversity and all that stuff, we managed to to still win that that tour. Which, yeah, I should don't really know how we did it because it was it was very very tricky and 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 very very tough. But staying four four five weeks in a hotel with the same group of people, you you learn you learn you you get to know them really really well. So that was a the fun part of it. Yeah, some would irritate you too. I'm probably oh, that guy. Is that you? <laughs> Are you that one? Yeah, I was probably that guy. Yeah. Um, and then again, you get a, got a massive group of guys that are not playing mm-hmm. and w- w- they can't go anywhere. So they are drinking by the pool mm-hmm. and we, some of us need to sleep. And it's just like, now we have to phone and can you please take it inside? And it was just, it's just, the reg- no, there was just, it was, it's just, I can't yeah, explain strange, what, yeah, 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 strange atmosphere and strange everything and, and the games with no there was no crowd at all yeah did they do that um you know where you press a button for a crowd like for a cheer no that, we didn't have it was that total silence, no, it was total everything. silence there was in there was like luckily there was a quite a big group of our play non-players and of theirs as well so they would cheer so they had like pots and pans that they got out of <laughs> and they were eating that that's so good yeah so that was a bit annoying for us but that's yeah that's what we got to and i wouldn't say it, it took a lot away from it for me yeah um in terms of the intensity and the fight and all that i don't think that it was not great not to share it with people that was that was yeah. a big thing it takes a lot away from it but still when you when you pitch up it, you don't really realize that yeah, a lot compete, yeah. yeah just looking at the the team at the moment and, and a lot of guys is obviously still around from the world cup c is obviously the captain and, and you've got rassi and jack I mean, who are sort of the, the big talkers in the changing room when you're when you're in a World Cup final, you're in a, a Lions test and there's a lot on the line. Who are the guys who are really sort of speaking up? Not a lot really was said. I think Eben spoke quite a bit in, at half time against England. Um, but CR has grown also from a lot from 2019 to where he is now. He's got a lot more influence in, and confidence in what he says and his voice. Um, he leaned on a lot of guys back when he first started, um, which which I respect a lot for. Um, guys like Dwayne, you lean on Dwayne and Eben and Andre Pollard and those guys. But we have a, we have certain leaders and certain um, aspects of the game which they would have to lead as well. So those guys would get that their opportunity to if there's anything if need to improve or need to um, yeah need to improve on or just keep it the same. It's going well. Um, so I think that was a good, good like leadership group that we had, but motivationally would be probably Yebin and then Coach Rassi would would um, probably have the final say. Going into this year's World Cup, it seems like you guys are in a u- unique position, much like the All Blacks from 2011 and 2015, mm. where the core group of the players are essentially the same. Old. Um, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> Young but but in the sense that like you, you've stayed together, you're still mm. playing really really good high level rugby. What is it that you think, from your perspective, you guys need to do to achieve that goal of back to back? I think definitely um, trusting like the way we used to play, like trusting that process. Mm. But you have to evolve on that, so we can't just expect to just get the same outcome because yeah. we play the same way. Um, and I think in in the, the past year or so we've we've showed a bit of different styles that we we can adapt to. Um, so I think definitely just just adapt. You have to have to be able to adapt and improve and um, have different aspects to your game. Like we we can't just six, um, expect the same result because we play the same. Yeah. It, it doesn't work that way. So we need to evolve, and we we've spoken about evolving in, in certain areas. What are some of the differences that Jacques has brought in as opposed to when Rassi was the coach? Not much. Um, so they still work very closely together. Oh, okay, yeah. um, Jacques is still mainly on defence and Felix Jones on attack with Coach Stocker. And so they'll still handle those departments really well. Um, Jacques obviously has now the responsibility of speaking to the media a lot more, um, post and, and pre-game. Um, so whenever Russ is there, it pretty much feels the, the same. Um, he'll still have the same chats that he used to have with us. Um, but I think Jock will just be a bit more involved in, yeah. in everything. But they still just run their departments really well. And just jumping forward 
now off to, to where we are now in Tokyo. Uh, obviously spent a few years with Sale and now made the decision to come to Japan. How big a decision was that for you? Obviously you'd spent a bit of time here with the World Cup. Did that mm. sort of solidify it in your mind? Yeah, definitely. Um, coming here for that, and we were here for probably the longest from any, uh, out of any team and spending time here and I yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think the pool, the, another big pool was um, obviously a lot of the Springbok guys playing in Japan and hearing what they're saying about Japan and playing in Japan. And then the amount of games you play in terms of playing in Europe, it's just for me getting a bit older, maybe starting a family soon, those type of things are definitely going to come into play a lot more. But they didn't expect the level to be so good. Like there's some really, really good quality players around and some big lads which you have never heard of which can run through any team so um, I thought it was going to be a bit easier on the body but I don't think it, it is it's just the amount of games you play would then hopefully extend your career and give you a bit more rest period the holidays obviously so you're playing less seasons but did the yen come into it at all yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it definitely does I'm yeah. not gonna not gonna lie but um, uh, just the amount of of rugby that I played at Sale. Yeah, yeah um, it's totally different. It's compared to what you play, yeah, it, it, it's ridiculous. I wanted to ask you, what are the, some of the, I guess, different or interesting things that you've faced here in Japan off the field compared to, say, back home? Grocery shopping. If you don't have Google Translate, you will <laughs> never get anything in that shop. So that was, that was our first challenge. I think normally a 15-minute trip would take an hour just by scanning everything. And, and that was... A, and it's, it's interesting and, and you you see funny fruits and veg and um, but yeah, just to try and get to a normality as possible mm. we've we there now I, f- I feel we we getting pretty comfortable and, and the missus is is sorting out most of that that side of things and and managing to speak to the butcher and make sure we get the right cuts and all that type of things but that was probably the the, the strangest thing for me in the in the beginning was just to just normal things yeah like getting what, what you used to do like just you can't which milk do you buy I struggle with milk big yeah. time as well yeah like just stuff like that yeah. you have to scan everything and then it's direct translation which means something a bit different than what but still milk but it maybe says something yeah. else and I'll um, so yeah I think that was that was a big thing food and all that type of things is not really an issue for me I I um, I crack on I'll, I'll try pretty much anything um, but have you had to get your hair cut while you've been here? Yes. Not cut a lot, just a little bit. Um, yeah, just just once. Um, was international salon. <laughs> we're, we're willing to risk it. I wasn't. I was. I was scared, but I, I had a few blonde ladies that live um, one of our players' wives and stuff that <laughs> that's been there that gave me confidence because I went to. Our, coffee shop um, where we go to parlor um, where all the players go to after training and it's sort of like a barber shop slash a salon slash coffee shop in the corner and I asked the guy can he do my hair could he be able to do it and he said he'll try his best oh that's nah, good yeah, then I said, it. no it's a I'm rather not gonna do this thank you and then so luckily got got one actually close by to you so yeah yeah. <laughs> well, you went and you lost all your hair, basically. Yeah, I cut my hair recently and I FaceTimed my daughter and she said to me, by the time I get in a couple of weeks, will your hair be grown back? She don't want to be seen with me with my hair cut like this, so I'm stressing. Didn't you have a few? I had the dreadlocks for a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then I uh, had like a, it was a little bit bigger than this and then I decided to cut it and yeah, she's mm. right off me. So all right. I'm hoping it grows back pretty quick. <laughs> but what's it like, I mean, playing for, for a company now? Like it's quite a, a different setup, I guess, to what you've been used to in the past? It is definitely a bit a bit different. Um, it's, it's, it's a completely different thing to an, to an owner, essentially being, you know, he's, he's bought the club and he's like, he's in control, which they are, but it's, it's a diff, completely different feel. Like the company, Players and supporters, they love the rugby side of it and they also do anything to support it. Um, but yeah, just funny things like when we play against Toshiba, it's like traditionally the biggest game against these two companies. Like I didn't, didn't even know about it, but some guys would get extra bonuses if they win that game. And it's a unique experience. And um, like the 
players that have to, some are not con uh, professionally contracted, which have to go and work after training and stuff like that, which I never really thought of could be a thing. But yeah, they, they deal with it and they, they roll with it. So yeah. it's interesting, yeah. Recent sort of shocks that you've gone through in terms of the culture. We've been here a couple of years now, but the, even at this stage, are there still things that are surprising you? I think sometimes you want to buy something that looks really nice and you end up, if you just like translate it, it's like shark fin soup or something. And <laughs> that's one, luckily it hasn't happened to me, but a few of the uh, Safa boys went out for dinner somewhere and they thought they were eating beef that tastes like chicken and fish and it ended up being whale meat. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, that, yeah, I would, I'm gonna, Try and make sure that doesn't happen to me. Google but, Translate. Yeah, no, no, no big shocks as of yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think a few boys have have fallen into the trap before. Yeah. He's yeah. eating horse. Have you tried the horse? Over no. Here? Have you? No. I'm good? too afraid yeah, to. Lovely. Yeah. It was good. And she was honest and open straight yeah. up. She said, this is horse. I said, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Awesome, guys. I, unfortunately, <laughs> that is all we have time for today. Oh, okay. But thank you, Faf, for coming on. And um, thanks, guys. It's good to catch up. And Lovely. That was yeah. awesome. I appreciate thanks the conversation, but I learned yeah. a lot from that. Thank you. Thank you very much for you, too. I appreciate it. Eh? Thanks, guys. Awesome.